Mary had trouble getting dressed for work in the morning, but not for the usual reasons. She had no trouble picking out an outfit, but once she had pulled her chosen outfit off the hanger with her right hand, she usually found that her left hand had also picked out an outfit and pulled it off the hanger, an outfit that she did not choose and that was not appropriate for work. It was far too colorful and flamboyant. This wouldn't be a problem if she could simply put the outfit back. But she couldn't. She wanted to, and she tried to will it to occur, but her left hand simply wouldn't put the outfit back. It wouldn't even let go. She would have to call her husband to literally pry the outfit from her left hand. This may sound like science fiction, but it's not. Although the patient's name likely isn't Mary, the story is based on a documented case of a patient with what is called alien hand syndrome. And wardrobe selection difficulties are not the only symptom. Another patient had trouble buttoning his shirt in the morning because, as he did so with his right hand, his left hand would unbutton every button that he had buttoned. Another patient's left hand would drop his trousers as soon as he had pulled them up. Another patient known as MP had a left hand that would throw unwanted ingredients into her omelet. Uncracked eggs, an unpeeled onion, and a salt shaker. It also took her forever to pack for a trip because her left hand would usually throw everything out of the suitcase after she had put it in. Sometimes when she went to embrace her husband, while her right hand would reach around to draw him closer, her left hand would be trying to push him away. Alien hand syndrome is 100% real. In fact, we even know exactly why they behave as they do. It's because the two hemispheres of their brain have been separated. In a sense, their brains have been split in two. Now, why do I mention alien hand syndrome at the beginning of a course on metaphysics? Because it raises a number of very important and interesting metaphysical questions. First of all, in split brain patients, is each hemisphere producing a separate stream of consciousness? If so, might this happen in healthy people as well? And how could we know? And how exactly do brains produce conscious mental activity anyway? To answer such questions, we might wonder how the brains of such persons get split in the first place. Our brain is constructed of two hemispheres connected by a band of tissues called the corpus callosum. In patients suffering from alien hand syndrome, it has been damaged. Doctors sometimes cut the corpus callosum intentionally as a treatment for grand mal seizures, but it can also be damaged naturally by a stroke. Why does this produce such strange behavior? because the two hemispheres can no longer interact in the way they did before. In an intact brain, if the right brain, which controls the left hand, decides it wants to wear something flashy to work, the left hemisphere, which controls the right hand, can tell it no. It can send inhibitory signals to prevent it from acting on that desire. But if the corpus callosum is damaged and the right hemisphere gets a hankering to wear a tube top to work, there's nothing the left hemisphere can do about it. It gets even more interesting when you consider how these so-called split brain patients behave under experimental conditions. One hemisphere can read a word that the other one did not, or be ignorant of a command that has been given and is being followed. It can unknowingly react to pornographic imagery shown to the other hemisphere and can even express different life ambitions. One patient, known as PS, in an experiment conducted by neuroscientist Joseph Ledoux and psychologist Michael Gazzaniga, verbally replied to the question, what do you want to do when you graduate, with, I want to be a draftsman, I'm already training for it. But when this question was fed directly and only to the right hemisphere, the left hand spelled out automobile racer with scrabble tiles. The right hemisphere in these patients, it seems, not only has its own experiences, but its own desires and aspirations, maybe even its own personality. So now, more metaphysical questions are raised. Exactly how many persons are there in a split-brain patient? Are there two? If so, where was the second person before the patient's brain was split? And where does the second person go if the corpus callosum is repaired? And what do the answers to these questions tell us about personhood itself? As we shall soon see, examining how this question must be answered would seem to entail that personhood is a fiction, that persons don't exist at all, or that at least they are very different from what we think they are. And this is what metaphysics does. These are the kinds of questions the metaphysician asks. Metaphysics is the study of the fundamental nature of reality. It often concerns itself with things beyond the physical world, and persons and minds are sometimes thought to be such things, 
And if God exists, at least as many conceive of him, he exists beyond the physical world. And so questions about God's existence are metaphysical questions as well. But metaphysicians are also concerned with the nature of the physical world itself. For example, the theory of relativity seems to suggest that space-time itself is a substance. In addition, discoveries in quantum mechanics raise serious questions about the very nature of matter and reality. As we shall see, it seems to suggest, at least on some interpretations, that the basic building blocks of reality are not solid material, but instead are probabilistic wave functions. Quantum particles don't even have a definite location or velocity until they are observed. Interpretations of quantum mechanics suggest everything from the idea that our conscious experiences determine what happens at the quantum level to the idea that there are multiple universes. In fact, science is relevant to metaphysics in a number of ways. Not only do scientific theories like quantum mechanics raise interesting questions to ponder, but discoveries in science can help answer them. For example, discoveries in neuroscience shed light on the philosophical problems that surround the human mind. And what can be explained and what can't be explained in physics may be relevant to whether or not God exists. So it's important to begin by understanding the relationship between science and metaphysics. Science is a method for discovering the truth about the way the world is. It's our most reliable method. It does so by formulating conflicting hypotheses, deriving predictions based on those hypotheses, and then seeing which hypothesis is most fruitful. That is, which hypothesis correctly predicts what happens in the physical world. Scientists will also favor an hypothesis if it has wide scope, that is, if it has explanatory power. They will favor it if it's simple, if it doesn't require numerous assumptions or entities, and if it's conservative, that is, if it doesn't conflict with things that we already know to be true. Like metaphysics, science is also a branch of philosophy. Science was originally called natural philosophy and became its own discipline when certain philosophers became concerned enough with certain problems, developed ways of studying them, and then discovered definitive answers to those questions. This new knowledge opened up whole new avenues of research and a new discipline was born. This, in fact, is why philosophy has an inaccurate representation as a discipline that simply spends its time trying to answer unanswerable questions. Philosophy, in fact, has answered many questions. It's just that the answers it has discovered are so important that they give rise to the existence of their own disciplines, leaving philosophy and the philosophers that don't enter that discipline with the rest of the questions that have yet to be answered. Aristotle was one of the first philosophers, but also one of the first scientists. In fact, this is where the subject of metaphysics gets its name. Andronicus of Rhodes, who lived about 300 years after Aristotle, compiled his works in such a way that Aristotle's arguments regarding being and first causes would be read after his explorations of the physical world, his physics. So, although metaphysics has since expanded far beyond being and first causes, the word originally and literally meant after physics. We need metaphysics today because although science can get us very interesting measurements and results and produce interesting and fruitful theories, it can't always identify the conceptual or philosophical problems that are raised by those results or that might exist in those theories. Sometimes we need metaphysics for that. Let us consider one of the most important examples of where science needs metaphysics, specifically in quantum mechanics. It's regarding something called the Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen experiment, or EPR for short. A physicist named John S. Bell used the experiment to determine that electrons do not have a definite spin until they are measured, for example, by a Stern-Gerlach device. Yet, if a pair of electrons is emitted from a single particle, the electrons will always have opposite spins, even if they are measured so far apart that not even information traveling at the speed of light could be transferred between them. If they don't have a definite spin until they're measured, yet information cannot be shared between them, how is it that they always have opposite spin? There are multiple theories that answer this question, but which theory is the best? And what does this entail about the very nature of reality? As we shall see, scientific experiments often cannot answer these questions. Some scientists even refuse to ask them. So it is here that we need metaphysics. Of course, we don't care who's doing the metaphysics, we just want the true answer. And physicists can and do engage in answering these questions. 
But unfortunately, some scientists are even hostile toward metaphysics. But good scientists recognize the need for it. In correspondence with me, physicist Sean Carroll described a healthy relationship between metaphysics and scientists this way. Quote, the philosophers are very good at uncovering inconsistencies or mistakes in the kinds of causal heuristic understanding that scientists are often willing to accept. For a physicist like me, philosophers can be very helpful in helping explain what the problems are in our current versions of quantum mechanics, or in the origin of the arrow of time, or the nature of probability, or what counts as an explanation." End quote. What does he mean by heuristics? Heuristics are base assumptions or rules of thumb exactly the sort of thing that metaphysics is designed to question. I know we are moving rather quickly. Don't worry, in future lectures we will take one thing at a time. But hopefully we now understand the importance of metaphysics and its relation to science. So now, how do we do metaphysics? We start by granting certain fundamental assumptions, because we have to start from somewhere. We will assume some things that have been widely accepted in the Western world that minds exist, that persons exist, that we are free, that God is real, etc. But then we will turn around and examine those assumptions to see whether they actually are true and if they actually make sense. Are they really coherent? Do they conflict with other fundamental assumptions we make or things that we know? Perhaps they even conflict with each other. And do we really have any good reasons for thinking that they are true? To do metaphysics, we have to realize that even our most basic, fundamental, and cherished assumptions may be wrong. This thought might surprise you, but it shouldn't. After all, our fundamental and cherished assumptions are the assumptions that we are least likely to examine on our own. It shouldn't be too surprising that we turn out to be wrong about something we haven't thought that much about. And in doing metaphysics, when you do realize that you've been wrong, you have to be willing to admit it and to change your mind. Otherwise, what's the point? If you're going to think long and hard about something to discover the truth, what good does it do you if you won't embrace the truth once you've found it? There are also a couple of important lessons to keep in mind regarding how we do metaphysics as we progress through the course. First of all, you have to understand the importance and the point of a thought experiment. When doing metaphysics, we will often consider hypothetical scenarios that are sometimes rather ridiculous, things that could really never happen or at least will likely never happen in your lifetime. We'll think about, for example, whether a person could really survive being transported by a Star Trek-style transporter, or whether or not copying your neural configuration onto a computer hard drive would result in consciousness emerging from that computer. You may think such questions hold no value since such things will likely never happen, but this misunderstands the point of a thought experiment. For example, suppose you are considering whether you should marry Pat or Jean. A friend asks you to imagine that you are on top of a 50-story building with Pat and Jean each holding onto one of your hands, but you only have enough strength to pull one of them up. Which one would you save, he asks. If you replied, I guess I would save Pat, but I don't see what that has to do with anything, that would never happen. Then you missed the point. Of course that would never happen, but the fact that you would save Pat if it were to happen seems to indicate that you love Pat more, and that's who you should marry. Now that was an example about your own personal life. In metaphysics, the kinds of examples we use are different, but the way they work is the same. Thought experiments expose your intuitions and reveal your beliefs about certain topics. The fact that they would never happen is irrelevant. When doing metaphysics, we must also realize that if an argument that supports a particular conclusion fails, that doesn't mean that the conclusion is false. After all, I can give you a bad argument for just about anything. Um, I like Vietnamese food, therefore the world is round. That's a bad argument, but that doesn't mean the world is flat. It just means that argument doesn't establish its conclusion. If you want a good reason to believe that the world is round, you're going to have to look someplace else. The same is true for arguments in metaphysics. This doesn't mean that you can be justified in believing whatever you want, but just keep in mind that one bad argument toward a conclusion doesn't necessarily mean the conclusion is false. Another thing about metaphysics is that it can get a little frustrating. Because we are dealing with questions that can't be answered scientifically, at least not yet, 
we are going to find very few definitive answers. We will discover and discuss a number of possible answers and theories, but most, if not all of them, will be subject to very serious objections. This can be a bit discouraging. You will wonder where the truth lies. But there are a few things to keep in mind that can alleviate such worries. First of all, you should realize that this is a problem that's dealt with in all of philosophy. As I mentioned before, once philosophical pondering results in definitive real-world answers, those answers spawn a new discipline, be it science, math, law, what have you, leaving philosophers to deal with the remaining questions that have yet to be answered. Just about every discipline involves philosophy. In fact, the PH in every PhD stands for philosophy. So in participating in metaphysics and in philosophy in general, you are participating in a centuries-long pursuit of truth, one that has led to just about every major leap forward in human progress. Although you may not find answers for yourself personally, the questions that we engage in this course may lead to discoveries of truths that spawn their own disciplines and propel the human race forward. We really are on the frontier of human discovery here, so we should be able to find satisfaction even in searching for the answers that currently elude us. Metaphysics can seem frustrating because it may seem the answers to metaphysical questions are unattainable, but many of the answers that we take for granted today were considered to be unattainable by the ancients. What causes the seasons? What is the sun? What causes the weather? These were questions that seemed so unattainable that the ancients simply invented myths to explain them. Whether or not the ancients actually took such stories literally, they would have likely thought pondering about what truly causes the seasons to be fruitless as fruitless as ponderings about free will, the mind, persons, and God seem to some today. But it would be premature to quit before we even try. When it comes to unanswered metaphysical questions, something else that might feed our frustration is a faulty assumption about how many questions other disciplines answer. Metaphysics is not unique in being unable to give us ultimate answers to fundamental questions. For example, Although mathematics seems to give us very concrete knowledge, it's not that concrete at all. All mathematical systems are based on axioms, unproven, unprovable assumptions. Mathematics is the process of discovering what follows from those assumptions, but it's not like we know those assumptions are true. We just assume they are and work from there. But different assumptions will entail different things and produce different mathematical systems. And there's no way to use mathematics itself to discover which, if any, of the systems actually describe the way the world is. For example, in standard geometry, it is assumed that for any given point outside of a line, there is one and only one line that can be drawn through that point that is parallel to the original line. But, it turns out, this is an axiom of standard geometry. It is assumed, not proved. In fact, you can develop geometries that deny this assumption that are perfectly consistent. Some are even more consistent with other theories, like Einstein's theory of relativity. Standard geometry is very useful, but it may not actually be true. In addition, it's not even clear what mathematical truths mean. One plus one equals two, right? But what does the word one refer to in that sentence? What is the number one? And what does it mean for a number to be added to itself, and in virtue of what would it equal another number? And what does the word equal mean in that sentence? Philosophers have struggled with such questions for some time. Plato thought of numbers as abstract objects, literally non-physical entities that are more real and substantial than physical objects. He called them forms, and thought that there was a realm in which such things existed. Saying that one plus one equals two is to express some relationship between these eternal non-physical objects. Some metaphysicians today agree with Plato. They take properties like redness and squareness, and perhaps concepts like justice and goodness, to be abstract objects as well. They call such objects universals. Other philosophers disagree. They don't have room for unexplained non-physical objects in their ontology, their list of that which exists. They try to make sense of mathematical statements in terms of physical objects. The number one, they contend, refers to all single-membered sets, all lone objects. The number two refers to all dual-membered sets. And one plus one equals two is simply a fact about how all dual-membered sets consist of pairs of single-membered sets. But then we start wondering what in the world a set is. Is it something above and beyond its members? 
So it's not even clear that this solution solves the problem. One might think the notion that numbers are non-physical objects is silly, but when you think about it, numbers seem to have a direct influence upon the world. For example, harmonic ratios. For any given object that produces a tone, for any given property that object has that makes it produce that tone, if you decrease that property's value by one half, you will get an octave tone. The ratio is one to two. If you have a string that produces an E, you can cut its length in half and you'll get an E an octave higher. But you can also decrease its thickness by one half and you will get the same effect. But this not only works with length and thickness, decrease a glass's volume by one half or put twice as much water in it and upon striking it, you will get an octave tone. Conceivably, the world didn't have to work this way. It could have been that different properties require different ratios. To get an octave tone, you would need to cut length by one half, but thickness by two thirds, and volume only by a fourth. But no, the same ratios govern them all. Why? Could it be that the harmonic ratios are numbers floating up there in platonic heaven that somehow influence the world? I'm personally skeptical about that, but the point is, mathematics is not as concrete as it is often assumed. And we have to do metaphysics to even attempt to understand what it is all about. Another discipline that may seem concrete but isn't is science itself. First, all reasoning in science is inductive. It uses a method of reasoning where an argument's premises don't guarantee its conclusion, but only makes the conclusion likely. So almost nothing in science is ever proven 100% there is always the possibility that even the most highly confirmed theory could turn out to be false. In addition, there are multiple interpretations of many scientific findings and theories. Some have even argued that scientific theories, especially those that can't be observationally confirmed, are merely instrumentally true. They are useful ways to make predictions about the world, but do not actually describe the way the world is. Lastly, it's not clear how much explaining science actually does. For example, we have no idea why the matter in distant galaxies behaves like it does. To quote unquote explain it, scientists hypothesize the existence of dark matter, matter we cannot see that causes those effects, so that they don't have to reject our current understanding of gravity. But we don't actually have any further evidence that dark matter exists. Likewise, we can't fully explain the expansion of space-time and so scientists hypothesize the existence of dark energy. Yet, that really is just a placeholder for whatever causes the universe to expand as it does. So how deep can we say that our understanding of gravity and the universe really go? In addition, scientific explanations can only go so far. Eventually you get down to something that is a quote-unquote brute fact. It just is the way it is for no other reason than it is that way. For example, we have no explanation for why the fundamental constants of physics have the values they do. Why does the charge to mass ratio of the electron have the value it does? It just does. And even if we do one day explain something that was once thought to be a brute fact, we will do so by simply appealing to a deeper brute fact. There will always be something that is left unexplained. No scientific explanation will ever be ultimate. Now, it's important to realize that this is not a knock against science. For the same reasons, no field of study will ever give us an ultimate explanation. Explanations will always bottom out in some brute fact. And where science bottoms out is pretty deep down. It's just essential to realize that the fact that metaphysics does not give us ultimate concrete answers and explanations does not make it different from other disciplines. The only thing that really makes it different is that, unlike most other disciplines, it's very willing to admit and even draw attention to the fact that it doesn't provide ultimate answers. We can also find comfort in the fact that we can find and embrace answers to metaphysical questions. It's just that the study of metaphysics will reveal the consequences of the answers that we wish to embrace. You can adopt an answer to a metaphysical question, you will just have to decide whether the consequences of embracing that answer are palatable. Does that answer commit you to things that you are not willing to accept are true? For example, when we study the mind, you may find yourself committed to suggesting that mental activities like decisions do not have any causal effect on the world. They are not why you do what you do. Is that something that you're willing to accept or is that too far?
These are the kinds of questions you will have to consider over and over as we progress through the course if you want to adopt any particular answer to any particular metaphysical question. But perhaps, most importantly, we should realize that this is not necessarily the best approach to metaphysics. The goal of metaphysics is not necessarily definitive knowledge, but understanding. An understanding of the true nature and depth of some of the most important problems and questions that we can ask as human beings. What is the nature of mind, and how is it related to the brain? Can the mind exist without the brain? Do humans have souls? If not, how is it that you now and your eight-year-old self are the same person? After all, your personality is different, your beliefs are different, your body even replaces its cells roughly every seven years. How is it that persons persist through time, and what might this tell us about the possibility of an afterlife? And is there an afterlife? And is there a God, or are there gods, granting admission to it? And holding us responsible for our actions with consequences into the afterlife would only make sense if we have free will, if we freely choose to do what we do. But do we have free will? Aren't our actions dictated by our brain structure? And isn't our brain structure dictated by our environment and DNA, neither of which you have any control over? How is it, then, that we have free will? And what exactly is the true nature of reality? Quantum mechanics seems to suggest that the world isn't made up of solid bits of matter at specific places in space. Rather, physical reality consists of probabilistic wave functions that embody dispositions to occasionally give rise to particle-like behaviors in tiny regions of space-time. But what does that even mean? Might we have to rethink what it means for something to exist? Relativity theory suggests that there is no objective truth about whether two events happen simultaneously or even how long an object is. Such notions only make sense relative to a frame of reference and may differ greatly from one reference frame to another. Indeed, metaphysics raises the issue of what it even means for a claim to be true. What is the nature of truth? These are some of the questions that we will be considering, and true wisdom may be found not in answering them, but in understanding and appreciating the difficulty of these questions and the difficulties that surround the possible answers to them. According to Plato, the oracle at Delphi declared that Socrates was the wisest of all men. This confused Socrates, given that he often professed to have no knowledge at all. While defending himself before the court of Athens, Socrates explained that the oracle didn't mean that Socrates was the wisest, but that the wisest among humans are those that, like Socrates, admit their own ignorance. They admit when they don't know something. They admit it instead of pretending they do. Socrates was the wisest because he professed to have no knowledge, not to have solved the big problems and answered the big questions when he hadn't. Perhaps, when doing metaphysics, we should do the same. Metaphysics is the study of the fundamental nature of reality, the nature of the physical world itself, and that which may exist beyond it. Science informs metaphysical inquiry, and metaphysical questions are often about the discoveries and theories of science. We do metaphysics by examining our most fundamental assumptions about the way the world is, and being open to the fact that we may be wrong, and to changing our mind if we are. And, although it may be frustrating to study metaphysics because we so seldom get concrete answers, True wisdom can be found in understanding the problems and the shortcomings of the proposed solutions and in admitting our own ignorance, admitting that we don't really know the answers to the big questions. This may, in fact, be the most important step towards finding the answers we are looking for.